Welcome, everyone. Uh, so good to see you all. It's always so good to be here with you. And yeah, wow, it's just to see your smiling faces all over the world and to feel the prayer of our hearts that we're all joined together to walk through this together and come through into the light. And what a deep journey this is. And thank you all for uh, jumping down the rabbit hole with me. I feel almost like one of those, you know, when, when they jump out of a plane and we've all got our parachutes on together and we kind of all jump out of the window together and we, we float a bit and then we grab hands to hold hands. So we form a circle and then we're in a free fall. We're, <laughs> we're dropping, dropping down at a very fast rate of speed and we're just holding hands but we are smiling uh, while we're in the free fall. And that's what I think this is. And really, I think this purpose is the only choice. Uh, weekend is really an answer to a call because I know a lot of you are going through very intense experiences. And, um, and I think this session will be very, very helpful to put everything in a context and and understand that we are going through this big wake up and this forgiveness is a very, very deep journey. So I, I'm so grateful that you're all joined together and we're all in this together. I would say in terms of purpose that sometimes we call it forgiveness or we can call it the atonement, we call it healing, we call it awakening. There's so many different words that are synonyms for purpose, but what we can talk about is your purpose is in the mind. And that's why it seems to take a while to find your calling, your function, your purpose, because this whole world, all of time and space and this whole cosmos and this entire world was made as a, de as a deflecting shield, as a as a smoke screen, as a, as a veil, as a cover, so that you would not know your divine purpose uh, to wake up and remember your true identity as the living Christ. And so the veil is very thick, the fog is very thick, and sometimes I remind everyone that, that Jesus seemed to walk this earth 2,000 years ago and demonstrate the, the light of this unconditional love and this uh, this grace and this peace and this harmony of, of heaven and of the, our heavenly creator. And yet um, it seems to have been 2,000 years that have gone by just in order to even get a scripture like A Course in Miracles into the realm of time and space, reflected into this realm because the fog, the ego density is very, very thick. And so uh, I know myself, I feel extremely grateful to have had a reflection like A Course in Miracles and, and helping me make contact with Jesus and that direct contact which really has been such an acceleration in, in opening up and really letting go of all the beliefs of the world and time and space, which is really what the unconscious mind was, was filled with. So I just wanted to, again, frame our morning a little bit in saying that uh, uh, Jesus had said, you're afraid of each other, you're afraid of yourself, you're afraid of each other, your brothers and sisters, you're afraid of me, Jesus said, and you're afraid of God. And, and also I'll add the Holy Spirit in there too. So, so the brothers and sisters and who you seem to be as a person in this world is, is extremely fearful. Um, Jesus, the demonstration of divine love that, that seemed to be a, a demonstration in the flesh, so to speak, uh, or just a witness of this eternal love of the Christ. Uh, you're afraid of, of Jesus, if, afraid of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given as an immediate answer when the separation, when the belief in separation seemed to happen. And so there's a terror of listening to the Holy Spirit and there's a belief in sacrifice that somehow now in order to know God it seems like there's a belief that you have to sacrifice the life, the personhood, the world, 
uh, the memories and everything about this world that seems to be seems to be life on earth and it seems to be so important and now it seems like the relinquishment or the letting go of that make-believe self or substitute reality or uh, basically substitute identity it seems like the relinquishment of the substitute identity is extremely fearful and that's why there is such a huge resistance to listening to Jesus and the Holy Spirit because it's it's underlying there's this ego belief that's this underlying chatter well yeah what is it going to cost you you're going to you're going to pay some kind of price you're going to have to be penalized you you're going to have to be punished something there's this deep unconscious belief that it's going to cost something to remember God and remember the true identity and so when we talk about purpose being the only choice, we're talking about the answer. The, that purpose is the Holy Spirit's purpose. That purpose is the purpose Jesus shares, the purpose that Jesus demonstrates. That's, a, that's our wake-up purpose, which is forgiveness. And again, this is not forgiveness the way a lot of us were trained to think about forgiveness, because we were trained to think that we have to forgive people for what they did to us or what they didn't do to us that we wish they had done to us, forgiving the environment, forgiving authority figures, for, forgiving things that seem to happen in time and space. And Jesus is saying, no, that is not actually forgiveness. You're not, you're not forgiving what happened. You're having to learn to release what has never occurred. So again, it always helps to come back to remember that the ego is a projection. The ego projects a world of time and space and, and it projects images as part of its trick to keep the mind feeling guilty and, and afraid and terrified. And that is the dynamics of what's going on. So. In Corinthians, in the Bible, it says you're looking through a darkened glass. When you're looking at this world of images, you're really having a hallucination. You're having a nightmare. And the sneakiest thing about the nightmare is it seems to have some aspects that are good, that are enjoyable. And so it's, a, it's a, like a, a double sneaky uh, nightmare because you don't always recognize it as a nightmare, as wholly a nightmare. If, if, if this was recognized as a complete nightmare, you would drop it like a hot potato. You would just say, I am not buying into this uh, anymore. This, this is just a total ridiculous nightmare and I will have none of it. But the ego is so clever that it makes aspects of the nightmare seem attractive. So you get attached to the attractive aspects of the nightmare and then you, you don't want to let go of those attractive aspects and then in the end it all comes down to, wait a minute, this is a death wish that's generating this whole time and space cosmos. All of these stories are being generated, projected from a death wish and I need to let go of the death wish in my mind. So this is a very different teaching than a lot of the philosophies and theologies and religions that we've grown up with because I mean I don't know about you I was raised in Christianity I was raised on the on the Bible and Bible school and I was raised on Genesis in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and uh, it's taken me a while before Jesus has said well it's half right <laughs> that uh, God did create the heavens and he's not talking about the sky or the, the, the spheres, he's talking about eternal heaven, eternal love heaven. God is the creator of, of eternal love. Uh, God is the source of eternal love but, but the ego projected the earth and all of the other planets and spheres and galaxies and so on and so forth. So. So in order to really see this, that if this cosmos is a projection of the ego, Jesus makes it very 
clear that the world was made in hate. Uh, if you had to find the motivation under the seeming projection or the making of this world, it's hatred. And also, Jesus does say in the workbook, the world was made as an attack upon God, a place where God can enter not. Those are very strong words, and he's just establishing that in case you still are trying to salvage some aspects of the world, maybe you want to forgive and release 98% of this world, and then just keep the good stuff, you know, off and, and say, oh, I'm going to hang on to some of the good stuff. It's not so bad. It's, it's actually pretty good. Just remember that the purpose that generated the world was hatred. And you're not destined for hatred. You are d destined for eternal love and happiness and joy and harmony and oneness. You know, that's, that's our destiny. When it comes to purpose, the temptation of the ego, and Francis alluded to this too, is to project out many, many different purposes. So the ego has many different purposes for the body, many purposes for the world. In fact, if you think of the trillions and trillions of images that are part of this linear time-space cosmos, that the ego has invented its own unique, different purpose for everything. What's the purpose of, of a rug, or of a light, of a fan? What's the purpose of a body? What's the purpose of a planet, or a moon? What's the purpose of a, pla of a house, or a river? Uh, everything, a toothbrush, a toothpick, toothpaste, whatever you want to call it, the, every one of those things has a little bit uniquely different purpose. You know, we would say that, yeah, there's, there is slight differences to purpose for toothbrush, toothpaste, and toothpick. They may, they may all have tooth in them. Well, let me throw tooth in there too. A tooth, toothbrush, toothpaste, toothpick. Now, all of you who are following me, you've got you've got memories and you've got meanings that go into those four words that I've mentioned. And those four things actually share the same purpose. If I told you that those four things I just mentioned, tooth, toothbrush, toothpick, toothpaste, all share the same purpose, you might go, really? Tell me more about that because to the world, to the ego, they seem like very different images and they seem like they have very, very different purposes. What do they have in common? Forgiveness. What does that mean? They're all illusions. What does that mean? They all are projections. Okay, what's that, what's that mean? Uh, they all don't have a source. Hmm. What does that mean? None of them were created by God. Ah. So, that's how they're, they're alike. And you can do this with all the things that you perceive in your life. That relationship you're having trouble with, or that neighbor you're having trouble with, that body that you're having trouble with, that seeming symptom or illness or sickness that you're having trouble with, those emotions that seem to be swirling around there during your daily experiences, those all have a common purpose too, forgiveness. In other words, when we talk about the purpose of forgiveness, we're being told that we need to learn to join with Jesus and the Holy Spirit to overlook the error. And Many of us have practiced and tried. We, we, we do work with specifics. We try every day. We practice with our course lessons. We practice with forgiveness. And we practice with whatever's on, on the screen. We're dealing with a pain in the elbow. We work with it. You know, we offer taking that back inside and offering that up to the Holy Spirit. The things that we're watching on the news or we're hearing when we're talking to somebody on the phone that we don't agree with the things that we have judgments about, the things that we have opinions about, the things that we have concerns about. 
we're working it and we're working with the specifics because that's how it works with purpose. Purpose is a decision in the mind, it's a choice, but it's kind of like a needle in a haystack. It's buried under a lot of hay. <laughs> you know, if you imagine you're a farmer and you're told there's a golden needle out in your field and uh, it's over there, it's under that big pile of hay and you get the pitchfork out and you just start digging in there with your pitchfork and that's why a lot of pathways to God are about negation, neti neti, it's not this, it's not that, not this piece of hay, not that. It takes a lot of uncovering to find that golden needle, but that golden needle is the purpose. And you need to be guided to unwind the mind to approach that purpose. That that purpose is there, it's absolutely there. Jesus says in the workbook, he says, salvation is among your thoughts. Find it. I remember the first time I read that in the workbook, I'm like, find it? Okay, I hope you're going to help me find it because uh, I seem to have spent some maybe millennium uh, digging around for that one and, and I haven't seemed to be able to find that one, but th that's what we're being guided to do is find it. So only a constant purpose can endow events with stable meaning. As you're looking at a fragmented world and you're watching all these images and all this change and all these stories going on and you feel all kinds of conflicting emotions as you go through your, your daily experiences, it's because you haven't completely honed in on the homing beacon. You haven't honed in on that purpose because as soon as you come into that purpose in your mind, whew, the whole thing goes very, very still. The whole thing goes very, very clear. And the whole thing becomes to stabilize. It begins to stabilize as you embrace your purpose your purpose of forgiveness. Only a constant purpose can endow events with stable meaning. You aren't going to see a stabilized perception until you have a unified goal, until you have a unified purpose. Now, how does this work? How do I go from seemingly a very wishy-washy, fragmented, helter-skelter, herky-jerky, cracked perception to this, this still, calm perspective on the world. Well, let's just look at this. The ego made up different purposes for, for the body, for your life. You know, it may have different purposes for your relationships, for your economic strivings, for your culture, for all kinds of things that you perceive in the world. There's many, 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 many different purposes. And the ego generated and made all of that up, as, a, as I said, as a big uh, distraction or smokescreen. But as you start to tune into your calling, to your function, to your purpose, that purpose will start to unify everything that the ego made. In other words, the Holy Spirit can retranslate everything that the ego made. So the ego made fragmented purposes, the Holy Spirit can use a single purpose to unify it. So imagine all of your skills and abilities that you perceive you have as a human being. Uh, all the skills and abilities that you've been educated with, everything you've learned. You can drive a car, you know how to write, you know how to, how to sing maybe, or to speak. You, you learn how to do particular jobs, specific jobs. You, you learn how to earn money and, and save money and all the skills and abilities that the ego made so that you'll adapt and adjust to being a human being, a surviving human being, and now you realize it's part of a trap that you still will feel guilty if you follow the, the roadways of the world. All of them end in death. There's no happy ending when you follow the ego's purposes and the ego's goals. But with a unified purpose, 
What if you gave that singing ability over to spirit? What if you gave that writing ability over to spirit? What if you gave your speaking ability over to spirit? What if you gave, some of you are probably bilingual, trilingual, maybe you speak five, six languages. That's a, that's, those are skills that the ego has developed, but what if you gave that, that multi-language ability over to the spirit? What does that mean? It's the Holy Spirit only sees the body as a means of communication. In fact, you could even take it one more step and say, the Holy Spirit only sees everything in the world as a communication device. Everything in the world are just symbols that now Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that clear, pristine purpose in your mind, they can use anything that the ego generated to take you back to this unified awareness, to take you back into the forgiven world, the happy dream, the quantum field. It's all the same. It doesn't matter what symbols and language you use, but the spirit wants to take you back into your mind. You know, in Buddhism, they call it mindfulness. And this world was made by the ego to keep you mindless to keep you unaware of your thoughts, unaware of your feelings, so distracted with the, the characters on the screen that you would never question and come back in, into your mind. If I use a theater analogy, it's like the ego is so afraid of the light that it's like, it's like come on, let's, let's get away. Uh, from the light, you know, you're never going to make it back there and there's no help, you know, you're just going to get punished if you go back toward that light. So it's, it's made a very dark theater and it's got a screen, it's just like one of these old, old time movie theaters and it gets you seated down in that theater and then as the movie gets playing, you start to forget that you're watching a movie. You actually start to get identified with the characters in the movie. And you get all emotional because you'll get all wrapped up. You're not aware that you're in a movie theater anymore. You're not aware of the mind. You're not aware of the light. You're not aware of the film. You're not even aware of the projection. You've become so involved, so taken over by. You've, you, it's lesson number two. I have given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me. And you get so wrapped up into the story of the movie that you forget the theater, the projector, the light, you forget everything else. You're just, you're so emotionally entangled in these interpretations that are going on that you forget that you're dreaming. You forget that you're just watching a movie. The Holy Spirit sees the movie as neutral. The movie isn't positive or negative. Dreams are dreams are dreams. To the Holy Spirit, the, all the dreams are the same. It's just like leaves blowing in the wind, you know. It's just the, the appearance of change is all the Holy Spirit sees. But the Holy Spirit is anchored in, and sustained in the light, so the Holy Spirit knows that none of the leaves and none of the wind is, is real. So it's just like this serene thing of leaves blowing in the wind. But to the extent that you get wrapped up in those characters, you get wrapped up in what's going on with that dream, that's the extent it gets terrifying. It's horrifying. It's extreme fear. And, and you may have bits and pieces where you say, well, it's not so bad. I'm, I'm not, there are bits and pieces of this, uh, of this dream that are not absolutely terrifying. There's actually, you know, you could say to Jesus, there's some that are quite nice, you know, yeah, pretty good, yeah. And imagine that we're here this morning talking about purpose and, and I'm just inviting you to come with me on a journey and we're just going to, for a moment, we're going to hop off the screen and, uh, and I'm meeting you in the theater and, uh, oh look, Jesus is coming out, he's coming out of the back. He's got popcorn for all three of us. Uh, you, 
and I and Jesus are going to have some popcorn. Oh, nice big soda, refillable soda. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, we're all just going to sit there. And uh, the three of us are going to sit there and, uh, and watch the movie together. Now, as you're watching this movie with Jesus and I, I tell you, you may have some times where it's like seeing a life review. Imagine seeing your, it's not just what happened yesterday or the day before, but it's not only what happened in your past, but it's your whole life review. We'll say from birth to death, you know, it's, it's going to be, that's going to be the movie. The movie's actually a lot bigger than that. That's like the tiniest little sliver of the movie. It's so minuscule, you probably wouldn't even know it's there if you were back even further, but that seems to be important. And then as you're watching it, and you're watching some of the things that you think you did, and you're munching on your popcorn, and then sometimes you, you, see, you feel a little guilt for some of the things you said and did. You, go, you look at Jesus, you go, oops, sorry about that one. <laughs> Oop, sorry there. Ooh, that was a tough one. I like that one, though. That was a good moment there. That, you know, imagine doing the, it's still you're reviewing and you're still judging the film. And Jesus is very quiet. He's just got a big smile on his face and he's, he's throwing that popcorn in the air. He's catching it. He's just munching along, having a sip of the drink, just smiling, not saying a word. Mm. Because the point of mind training is to practice coming back into that theater with, with spirit, with Jesus, because you have to learn to see that movie from a state of non-judgment. You can't keep reading meanings and judgments and opinions, good, bad, right, wrong, onto those bodies, onto those images, because that's where the guilt is generated. As long as you keep throwing judgments all over that screen, and you're just in the theater, and you still keep throwing judgments and opinions on that screen, you're going to be tempted to go back onto that screen. You're going to be tempted. That's what reincarnation is about. It's a temptation <laughs> to still believe there's a, there's a better way than, than love. You know, that's all it is. It's, uh, Ken Wapnick one time, they were talking to him, asking him about deja vu, and he said, well, the whole world's deja vu. You know, <laughs> you're just... You're just reliving what is already over, imagining you're making the journey again. You're just, you're just reimagining what's already over and done. And that is the key point. Because if the script is written, if lesson number seven in, in the course is true, I see only the past, like I'm only perceiving the past, then what makes me think that I can find my purpose in the past? What makes me think that I should be looking for my purpose in the world? You know, I know a lot of us were raised with, you know, find your calling, find your purpose. You know, are you to be a, a, an ice skater or a, a sports caster or a, a ballet dancer or a construction worker, or a minister, or a husband, wife, a uh, mother, or a father. All these roles and concepts uh, are all part of the script. And, and what is the unifying factor among all these different roles and concepts is they have one unifying factor, and that's forgiveness. They're all unreal. They're all equally false. Not one single one of those roles was created by God. They're all projections of the ego. So Shakespeare had the famous quote, all the world's a stage and everyone must play their part. I did ask Jesus about that one time and he said, well, it's, it's mostly, it's, it's a helpful statement. He said, I'll make one additional correction <laughs> All the world's a stage, and divine mind can play no part. I was like, oh, okay. 
probably the, in, the, in the Bible, one of the most famous passages from the New Testament, if you meet a Christian, you know, if the Christian doesn't know this, this saying from the Bible, they probably won't pass very well for a Christian, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he show, whosoever should believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. If you're a Christian and you don't know that one, I don't know, they might throw you off in, to be something else. Uh, they might say you're an imposter. And Jesus takes that whole beautiful statement and he, he adds to it to, to make it correct. And instead of, instead of saying he gave his only begotten son, almost like as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for sin, he says he gave it to his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave it to his only begotten son, that he whosoever believeth in him should not perish but should have eternal life. So he went from gave his only begotten son, almost like a sacrifice on the cross, to he gave it to. What does he mean, he gave it to? It's talking metaphorically there about the real world, the happy dream. The happy dream of the Holy Spirit was given as a gift from the Holy Spirit to the sleeping Son of God. That he whosoever shall believeth in this happy dream shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. Oh, the happy dream will get you back to heaven. Not sacrifice, not penance, not punishment, not doing things or not doing things. And, and in the end, you even have to start to realize that all the functions, the many busy doings that the Holy Spirit will send you on, I've had a few of those over the last 33 years. He's had this body in 44 countries. And for a shy guy, he had me talking, giving talks at conferences and basements, backyards, barbecues festivals, ashrams, this body seemed to be all over the place uh, serving a calling of letting the voice for God speak through it. But, but you know, none of those body things that I, uh, David ever seemed to do, or any, they weren't even our, the purpose. They were inspired by the purpose. I have to say, I, David would have never chosen any of that. I, I sometimes have to say, pinch me, what is going on? What happened? I gave you my, my will and my life, and I gave you everything to use for the healing of the universe, and now, wow, involuntarily, you've had these miracles lighting up my mind, and I've seen all these witnesses of happy, joyful people all over the world, smiling faces, hugs, laughter, tears of joy, mystical experiences, all these things that have happened over these last 33 years, and, and yet Jesus has always assured me, no, it's not about anything that the body does or doesn't do. The purpose that inspires even these busy doings is all in the mind. And, and actually, the purpose doesn't come into form. You're given a special function. You will seem to play out a part as a character, but that is all coming as an inspiration. But when you're in that movie theater, if you forget about the theater, if you forget about your mind, if you forget about your thoughts and beliefs, and you are just so identified with that body, that character on the screen, it gets terrifying. It gets extremely terrifying because there is no escape on inside of that screen. As long as you believe you're in it, Jesus says you believe you're on the battlefield and the only way, he says, to find the peace is to go above the battleground, above the battlefield. He's like saying, come up with me, come back into the theater, come rise up in your mind and join with me, join with the light, join with the love, and you'll feel the relief that comes from joining with the one who is the comforter, who is the answer 
to the problem of time and space. So it's very similar when Jesus talks about the holy instant. The holy instant is very synonymous with purpose. And Jesus says about the holy instant, you cannot prepare for the holy instant without placing it in the future. So this idea of preparation, you see how even that is tied into bodies. Preparation. We're so tied into believing we have to prepare the way to be healed. Prepare the way. We're so much identified with the characters on the screen that we have even taken our function, which is forgiveness, and we've projected that out onto the timeline, and that's why we feel so conflicted oftentimes. Am I serving God? Am I doing the right thing? Am I, am I on it, moving in the right direction? There can be so much confusion when the mind is so identified with the body and with the behavior. So purpose is a choice in the mind, and, and that purpose is not dependent on anything of this world. That purpose is coming from your right mind. It's coming from the Holy Spirit and Jesus. And it will radiate through everything that you perceive. It will unify everything that you perceive. But that purpose cannot be confined to an object, an image, a body. There is no thing that exists in and of itself. Jesus talks about this in the workbook. Quantum physics talks about this. If you study quantum physics, it will tell you there is no world apart from consciousness. There, there is no observer and observed. There's only the quantum field which to the scientist is very mystical. It's, it's, it's very uh, mysterious. It's not mysterious to Jesus. Jesus is like, no, that's me and you eating the popcorn in, in the, the theater. That's what the quantum field is. It's when you're back with the, that unified spirit, then there's everything is calm because you're not getting caught up with anything on the surface. You seem as a human being to have millions and billions and trillions of choices to make, but actually you only have one. You always only have one choice and it's called the atonement. That Jesus discovered that. He's our way shower. That's why Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, because he discovered the escape hatch back to eternity, and it's called atonement. And now he's, he's with the Holy Spirit and, and the angels and everybody, they have provided this pathway back to heaven called A Course in Miracles. So as you answer your calling, you realize that in answering that calling, everything else without exception is taken care of. In other words, the behavior becomes almost like an autopilot. If, if you are lining up with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, then it's more like St. Augustine. I love St. Augustine. He, he had this beautiful phrase many, many years ago. He said, love and do what you will. Not saying love and do anything you want, but he's saying love and in the alignment with love, in the alignment with purpose, whatever flows from your behavior, the laughter, the joy, the smiles, the hugs, all those wonderful expressions, temporary expressions of that divine love will come involuntarily, miraculously flowing through you because, because you're lined up. And when you aren't lined up, when you seem to believe the wrong mind is, a, is an actual choice, attack could be real and you still feel an attraction to guilt or attraction to fear, then the body will again follow that and, and bodies have been known to do some pretty strange things in this world. They seem to have diseases, they seem to fight each other, they seem to argue, they seem to compete. They seem to go to war, 
And there's even within the linear perception, it's ego's perception, it seems that one body can actually destroy another body. What a wicked dream that wrong-minded perception is, but it's all it is, is it's the ego's purpose projected out so that you're interpreting the attack as happening in the form. You're interpreting the killing happening as out there. Even people that are really concerned about, let's say, killing animals and vegetarianism and so forth, there's still the perception is, is that, that the animal is dying. But what I'm saying is, is, is the death wish is in the mind. It's almost like wearing these dark glasses, these ego glasses, and then forgive them for they know not what they do. When you've got those dark glasses on, everything you perceive, there is nothing that's going to be helpful with those dark glasses on. You're going to have to get back into that theater and you're going to have to help Jesus remove the glasses. And if you take the glasses off with Jesus in the theater and you really start to enjoy watching the movie with Jesus, eventually you're going to get so happy that he's going to say, okay, now you're ready. I'm going to swoop you up and we're going to go back towards the, the projector and he's going to swoop you out of the theater, he's taking you back towards that beam of light in the theater, and he's going to take you back, and you're going to zoom right in, and he's going to take you in, and you're going to whew, pass through the film. Pass through the film, which is the ego, and go right into the light, far beyond a, a movie screen, far beyond a movie theater, far beyond little images passing in front of that light. He'll take you right back into that Christ light, right back into that God light, because of course that's all that's real is the light. The light is all that's real.